Welcome aboard to episode 162 of the Grunge Bible Podcast. It's great to have you aboard as my name is Chris Salona and I'm joined by Ethan Shalloway, my co-host here. And Ethan, how are we doing today? This is the last episode of April 2024. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Yes, it is. Yeah, it's been good. You know, we're just, uh, I think we're ready for May. Yeah, we're ready was, for it. April was good, but I'm ready for May. The weather is it's getting hotter. It's getting nicer. And um, yeah, my spirits are high. My energy levels are good. Nothing to complain about. How are you doing, man? Yeah, same here. Um, I'm doing really well. April was a pretty solid month for me, and I'm excited to kind of get on with, uh, with the good part of the year, as I like to think of it. I'm a big fan of the summer, uh, and it's coming. Uh, the temperatures are climbing, and we are still podcasting here at the Grunge Bible uh, universe. The studio. The studio. studio GB, yeah. Oh yeah, we've got just fire coming out of the studio on a consistent basis. And that includes today. Um, we've got a really cool episode, one that's been in the works for a really, really long time. And uh, today uh, we are joined by Todd Blake and Kevin Dima, who are three quarters of the band Mixed Up Everything. Now, if you're a fan of rock and roll music or grunge rock, been a while since I've done that. Um, One week, you know, you know who mixed up everything is. You, you you've seen them before. Um, they are absolute legends of the YouTube world, in particular, getting their start posting covers um, all throughout Melbourne, Australia, performing on various street corners and boardwalks and beaches and whatnot. Um, their YouTube videos have amassed over 100 million views, and they've got over 800,000 subscribers on YouTube. Uh, way back in 2020, they did a virtual show for us during the COVID-19 pandemic as a part of our shutdown shows series uh, over four years ago now. And um, in addition to just churning out awesome cover after awesome cover, the four brothers um, have created original music and they've released two albums and they've got a new one coming out in May, 2024 called what's the rush now. Um, so we were really excited to have Todd, Kevin and Blake on Kobe couldn't make it. He was under the weather a little bit, um, but we had three quarters of the, uh, of the band. Uh, and it was a really interesting conversation chatting about their, uh, kind of, uh, musical background. Why, the type of genre, why they're drawn to it, um, what recordings like cover musics, their biggest haters, coolest experiences, um, a whole lot of awesome stuff. And these guys are legends. Um, they are the encapsulation, in my opinion, of everything that's good about rock and roll music and everything that's awesome about making music. Yeah, it was really um, quite fun to have them on talk about music. Talk about jamming at a young age. These guys have been playing music their entire lives. and They grew up together as brothers, obviously. And, um, and they have a lot of, you know, really unique experiences that honestly, we didn't even uh, delve into the, you know, how many they've had, they've been playing for, you know, over 10 years and they're still only 24 at the oldest or 25 at the oldest, yeah. a couple of 21. So like, they're still very young and they have this, they have a lot of experience under the belt. So um, it really was a um, great interview, and we're looking forward to having them on again um, at the end of the year, maybe, or, you know, when, when the they have finished their summer touring, because I'm sure they're going to play a lot of shows this summer. Absolutely. Um, so really excited to present this conversation. Uh, and in conjunction with this interview, uh, with this episode of our podcast, uh, I want to bring the attention to the fact that they've got two singles out from that forthcoming album. Uh, and the two singles are Would You Be Me and She Hates Me Not. And She Hates Me Not was just released on April 25th. So it's nice and fresh. And uh, I believe the day this episode comes out on April 29th, we'll be sharing a nice little uh, Nice little snippet of that on the Grunge Bible Instagram page. So go ahead and check that out and uh, uh, listen to this conversation and support these guys. Uh, really, really cool guys. Yeah, you could call the new song some fresh tendrils, right? Absolutely. I think you could. <laughs> is it tendrils? Is it tendrils, you know, like the sprouts of uh, plants? I, I don't that remember. We... We, we, like, we looked it up live I'm when we did sure. the Super Unknown episode. Um, so while presumably you look that up live uh, because yeah. our producer uh, is taking a nap and can't do that, um, I would also <laughs> like to thank everybody that makes uh, conversations like this possible, everybody that supports this show. Um, been a lot of people who have purchased our merchandise uh, linked in the show notes. Uh, and then additionally, uh, we have a lot to be thankful for on the Patreon side. 
uh, and those individuals are contributing at a two, five, or ten dollar level per month, uh, which goes directly to us and helps us keep this show running, keeps the lights on at Grunge Bible HQ uh, well into our third year now. Um, you know, every step of the way for 162 episodes, which is a lot. So uh, if you like what we're doing, if you like what's uh, what's going on on this episode, and you feel inclined to support, uh, Patreon would be the best way. Uh, you can find a membership tier that works for you and your financials, and it will help us and our financials. So last thing before we go, yes, tendrils <laughs> is a noun found in botany and is a threadlight leafless organ of climbing plants, often growing in spiral form, which attaches itself to or twines around some other body so as to support the plant. So you could say that this new single is a tendril to their their musical to the career. Album. Yeah. Their album, and, everything. And to the forthcoming so. album. I like so that. The first if, if the one goal, like we're establishing a 2024 goal, even though we're already, you know, a third of the way through the year, um, we need to normalize the use of the word tendril. Yes. I'm going to start using it in conversations. I mean, every time the song comes up, I mean, I've, yeah, it, it's played a much larger yeah. a role in my life since we've talked about well, it. Well, it's like, it's like if I'm getting ready to go out, you know, with, with the boys at night and like, I have a shower beer, like that's just a tendril of the beers to come. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Dude, anything that supports the main cause. Yeah. Exactly. So like your your Patreon dollars are tendrils. Oh, yeah, like we may need like we may need to change all the tiers to uh yeah, tendrils. Like, like, like fresh tendrils, fresh. old tendrils. <laughs> Speaking like, of which, uh to go back to it, we could use some fresh, fresh tendrils in the yeah. Patreon sphere. It's been a while since we've been able to ring the bell. So do that for us uh, and listen to all of the new music coming from Mixed Up Everything. But before you do any of that, or while you're doing some of those things, uh, let's listen to this interview that we did uh, with Todd, Kevin, and Blake Dima from Mixed Up Everything. So we are joined by the brothers Dima. This is mixed up everything. If you guys want to give a quick introduction, um, we would love to hear it for the people out there that don't know. Just a general background. We'll, we'll obviously ask some questions, but we got three brothers. We're missing Kobe, but uh, why don't you guys? Let's kind of throw it to you guys for a second to kind of kick this off. So just an introduction. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah. What's yeah, your name? Sweet. So I'm Todd. Uh, I'm the lead guitarist, and sorry. I'll, I'll leave the guitar to like rhythm guitarist. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> we we'll mix uh, it up. Yeah, we you're do. the oldest, right? You're the, I'm oldest. the oldest. Yep. 24. Yeah. So you're the you're the lead if you're the oldest. Yeah, I, I take that just as you know birthright. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then and then also the uh, main vocalist as well. Uh, I'm Kevin, second oldest. I do drums. Nothing more than that. <laughs> I'm Blake, <laughs> guitar, just simple. Yeah. And I'm yeah I'm 21. And Kobe, the little guy, he's, how old is he? 20. 19, yeah. Bass man. So 1921, or uh, um, Kevin? How 23. Old are you? Yeah, I missed that. 23. 23. How old's the oldest? And 24. 24. Okay. Absolutely. That's no twins. Awesome. Yeah, we're not twins. No, no twins in the band. No Who's kidding. Got, who, who has the longest hair? <laughs> that's actually a discrepancy. I don't know. It's the age old question. <laughs> Who gets the haircut? The uh, who, who uh, gets I don't the think any of us have most. had a haircut in in yonks. Yeah. I don't know. At, at least <laughs> ten years. Yeah. I was gonna say because you've always got different ways of approaching it, where it's like you grow it out and like you're trimming it to cut off the loose ends, or you just go full on. Like I'm not walking into a barber shop for years, and uh, that's that's the right way to do it. That's the admirable way. So glad exactly. you guys. We're, are we're going that. caveman style. Just let it go. Oh yeah. yeah. Or, Loose that's ends you, or anything like that. Just that's how you save money. That's how that's how you do it. Exactly. Ironically, I our, our, our mom is actually a, a hairdresser. So no kidding. <laughs> yeah. It's like out of all awesome. the things that our parents do, it's like oh yeah, like I could get you know some certain services for free from like my parents who are in a certain line of work, and you guys have absolutely no need to go and get a free haircut from your mom. <laughs> Nothing. 
That's amazing. So, uh, so you guys are mixed up everything. And for the listeners out there, um, if you are fans of music and you use the internet, chances are you guys have come across uh, the work uh, that these guys have done. Um, you guys have been at it for a long, long time. Um, you know, kind of reaching across the globe. You know, from your native Australia, um, primarily originally through a lot of covers that I know went viral early and often. And uh, I know we kind of got together. Um, in 2020 when the pandemic hit and we uh, did a live uh, kind of like live stream show uh, that you guys do- did for us with some covers and I think there were some originals in there but you guys have been making music together as brothers for you know probably as long as you guys have been able to hold instruments and play instruments it's yeah kind of our like, entire lives really we started yeah. when we were in nappies you know until now mm-hmm. our whole lives I've- yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, and obviously, you know, that path has taken you many, many different places uh, and had a lot of interactions. And as you guys mentioned before, we started uh, the show here. You guys are currently in Albania. And I know this is an exciting time for you as you've got your third studio album coming out here shortly. You've got a couple singles out from it now. So a really, really exciting time. And, and I think it's kind of the culmination of, you know, the path that you guys have taken musically, uh, you know, first learning to play and, you know, then starting to record some of your favorite songs and share them with people and then you know inevitably get to the point where you're creating so if we could kind of go back i mean you guys have been you guys are quite young in some of those first videos you know playing music and so how did you guys get into music was uh were you come from coming from a musical family like were your parents into it did you have family friends um kind of was it at school that you guys kind of got first turned on to a lot of the music that you guys love Um, so actually, no, like a lot of people ask, you know, oh, your parents must have been musicians and that kind of thing, but no, neither of them were. Dad was just crazy into music. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, playing, you know, Rage Against the Machine and Chili Peppers and Metallica and all that stuff for us as we were kids, uh, as we were babies, you know, we wouldn't be able to go to sleep without listening to U2 or something like that. Like we were those kind of babies. And so we had that, we grew up watching like MTV and the Australian version, which is Rage. And, um... Yeah, it was just like, it was just so ingrained in us that we just like, we realized that's what we want to do when we grow up. And it kind of just uh, happened all naturally. Like we just picked up the guitar at a very young age and yeah. Yeah. And a lot of people think that like, you know, oh, it's your, your parents must have been, you know, real, you know, cracking down hard on you guys to learn new instruments and stuff. But it wasn't at all like that. They were just like, guys, do whatever you want. If you want to play music, it's up to you. And they were just like super supportive, whatever we wanted to do, to do the whole time they'd like uh, drive us to the city so we could go and busk and that kind of thing. So mm-hmm. but it, we, That's we, awesome. were also, we were doing living room concerts for our parents with like tennis rackets as guitars and Kevin was using pillows as drums. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's, That's awesome. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm a drummer myself and uh, our producer drew, he was a, uh, he was one of my childhood friends and we played guitar or he played guitar. I played drums. We played in a band starting when we were like 13, 14 years old as well. And so we pay, you know, we've played shows in the basement for the parents. They come down. It's like, how's the yeah. band coming along? And you play, and and um, there is nothing. I mean, I, I tell everybody to play an instrument young and play and play in a high school band. Play with your best friends, and um, you guys have a special opportunity because you, as a family, are a band. So you guys always have someone to jam with, and I think that is like without knowing too much about the genesis, like just the fact that you guys had each other to always play with and always someone to jam with and push each other. Like it's no surprise that you guys have, have, you know, progressed the way you have. And it's just, it's such a lovely thing to be a part of when you're younger. So like, yeah. What's it like being in a band with all your brothers though? It's the best. Yeah. yeah you don't have to awesome. schedule rehearsals, right? <laughs> you just, yeah. <laughs> you, whenever you want, whenever you're ready, you're just like, hey, let's, let's play some music. Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah. Everyone lives together. It's just, yeah, it's easy to, it's always easy to find time that's yeah, yeah exactly. seems to be having a better go of it than the gallagher brothers and oasis did you know <laughs> <laughs> so far so good Don't yeah, you, I mean, you guys exactly. are sitting together on a couch right now and nobody's thrown thrown an elbow at anybody so <laughs> things must be going all right hey, we're on our best behavior for you guys so yeah exactly yes yeah, as soon as <laughs> you don't uh, have to you don't have to yeah exactly <laughs> get some fireworks as, going as you can expect it's not always like peace and quiet having four brothers around we do you know throw a few punches here and there mm-hmm Rebel well, the abuse. nice part is you guys can be really <laughs> honest with each other. And like, at the end of the day, you know, it's like, you're, you're my brother. So I, I'm not going to be mad at you. Well, unless you're the Gallaghers, but like, yeah, you're not, you're not going to be mad at each other forever. I mean, that's just how the brother bond is. It's very special. So 
That's yeah, awesome. 100%. Yeah. Now, I was actually, I was just about to say the same thing. Like if, if Blake comes up with a pretty bad riff, I'll just go Blake. That's a shit riff. And right. isn't, is there not going to be any of that? Like, uh, harboring bad feelings against each other and that kind of thing. It's just it's like yeah. that's what it is. Say it how yeah. it is. And yeah, that's no one stark. gets offended. That's stark. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's stark. Yeah. I don't know if you guys ever seen the Metallica documentary, Carlos, but La yeah. Lars, yeah, yeah, Lars, fucking stark, and he's like, I'm, I'm with, I'm with Lars there, actually. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I love that scene. Like, I don't know if it was because the cameras were on, but it, it was great. He's just like, it's fucking stark. Um, that's great. And sometimes, yeah, you definitely need like when you're playing stuff and you're like trying to jam and you're just like. Uh, this is not it. Like, how do I tell my bassist? Like, he needs to do something totally different. <laughs> you know? mm, exactly. That's yeah, just cool. to navigate the politics of those situations. And it, and it's interesting, you know, because like you guys are in a family together, you guys are brothers, but I think, you know, there's got to be a level when you're playing or when you're recording or, you know, uh, writing songs. It's kind of, uh, that's like a different element of the relationship where it's like, you know, uh, you know, it just kind of changes that element where you're able to kind of work together professionally at this point, but also maintain that family environment and kind of balance those things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> talking about, yeah, right. <laughs> talking about um, some of the earlier, we'll, we'll start with the earlier stuff, you know, covers and, or, you know, playing on the boardwalk and stuff. What is one of your fondest memories you know, one of your favorite other, you could be favorite covers, you know, it doesn't have to have went viral or one of the favorite performances that what, when you were growing up that made you be like, you know, all right, that feeling right there, that's what I want to chase the rest of my life. Like, when was it where you're just like, you know what, that was freaking awesome. You know what I mean? Like we just got yeah. say like someone just gave us a random hundred dollar bill and like our tip and said, chase your dreams, you know? Like one time that happened, we were playing a show and before the lady, we were like warming up and the lady was like, chase your dreams. And like, and she like, she's like i can't stay for the show or something like that but it was like a really great moment and that happens when you're young when you're very influ uh you're influenced by a lot of that stuff so what's one of those memories that really stick out to you guys funny that, yeah, that you mentioned the hundred dollar bill thing because there's one early memory of us when we used to play in melbourne on the streets on the south bank river for those of you out in australia in melbourne but there was this one day very early on maybe it was our, like our third time ever on the street and this cool guy came up to us and said, I'll give you 20 bucks if you play Killing in the Name right now. Mm -hmm. And so we jammed a really rough version of it because we didn't know it properly, but, you know, we gave it a shot and yeah. he absolutely loved it. He gave us $20 and that was by far the most anyone had ever given us at that point because before then it was, you know, 20 cents, two bucks and whatever. Yeah, like, to get a $20 make... bill was like something else. Mind-blowing at that time. <laughs> it's like you're made <laughs> of like, money at that point. <laughs> You're like, guys, if we yeah. can make $20 for every song we play, <laughs> we're in we're good shape. Make killing. <laughs> yeah. And That's then exactly the 50s and 100s thought. started dropping in and we didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Buy a new guitar, right? <laughs> yeah. Buy some cymbals. <laughs> More like buy some donut kebabs. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That's where the priorities have to be for sure. If you think about it though, kind of like performing like that and being able to uh, like take requests and maybe dip your toes into the water of certain songs that you may not have rehearsed as well or practice as well. Like that's got to be skill developing in a certain way that, you know, wouldn't happen if you guys are just at home jamming because there's a, a large element that I think you learn from a very young age, obviously of like working a crowd and like being able to improvise on the run and everything. And, and that's probably something that you guys have been able to carry forward into the way that you write and certainly you know as you're, you're starting to perform i know you've got a bunch of dates coming up here this year um do you feel like there's a common thread between those skills and experiences you had you know as as young young guys uh to this point forward yeah definitely because as we were you know in school on the weekends we just do two weeks uh sorry two hours of you know busking on the streets and it's like that's that's practice right there as well as like performance practice performance practice yeah. yeah so it just it it all kind of adds up and so by the time we were like 18 years old we had way more performance practice than most people our age would have and so it all kind of like builds up into what we like what we have now which is just you know i don't know it's just what we've, what we've got is good at the moment plus i think the amount that we were able to rehearse being brothers was just so like beneficial to the band because like we could rehearse literally like eight hours a day and it wouldn't be a problem because we live in the same house, and, mm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's not a, an instance of like, oh, somebody has to get a ride to come over here or, you yeah. know, I've got different schedules or like this person's mom doesn't want them out of the house because they have to study. You know, you guys are all in the same house together. So the logistics of it were probably quite a bit easier. 
It's not like we're doing school homework anyway. No, exactly. That's not cool. I mean, rock and roll 101, like you can't be good at school <laughs> and be good at music. Yeah, that was always whenever my singer said I got to do schoolwork. I was like, that's bullshit. I was like, you don't need to do that. Like, get over here. We got to jam. Yeah, classic. Exactly. <laughs> now, the guys who tried to, you know, get all the schoolwork done as well, instantly kicked out of the band. Back yeah, exactly. Bands. Yeah, we got that's Bruce the Dickinson. one test. Bruce Dickinson, Dexter Holland. They are the exceptions. Smart guys. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's always maybe one or two that are exceptions to the rule there. Um, so as, as we kind of discussed earlier, like that first kind of light bulb moment where it's like, hey, we played Killing in the Name of and this guy gave us money that had to feel very fulfilling at the beginning. And it's like, OK, like we can you know, we can do this and be entertaining for people. Um, was there a similarly singular event that kind of took you guys from like, hey, this is really fun and we're all passionate about music and it's fun playing with my brothers to um, you know, we could take this somewhere and we could turn this into our, our profession and our career and, and start to, you know, write our own songs and record them and share them. Like, was there a moment that that decision was made or that shift was made, or was it just kind of an organic process? I'd probably point it down to that first album. Yeah. Like before that, we were kind of just doing whatever we wanted and playing covers and stuff for fun. But then when we got to writing that first album, it was kind of like, okay, we're taking it a bit more seriously now. And yeah. And then especially going in to record it, like our first time in a recording studio was just like, wow, this is the real deal. Mm -hmm. And we all remember one specific moment where uh, we recorded like the first couple songs on in that first studio session. And we were like, damn, we didn't know we were this heavy. Cause we didn't, we, we had never heard, heard ourselves on like full electric instruments and everything like that. So it was just like, yeah, a shock to us. I was shocked. It's <laughs> yeah, like, oh, wow. Like this sounds a lot different, you know, like on the street versus, you know, being in this, oh, yeah, in that this was environment. Yeah, all acoustic on the street, like chill mm -hmm. kind of setting. Yeah. It's like you never really got the chance to turn it up to 11, especially in that environment. And we've talked to a lot of musicians before that like almost exclusively would play live or, you know, just do like, uh, you know, just different different sets at different venues and whatnot. And like the first couple of times that they had the chance to go into a, a recording studio, you know, and, and work with people in that setting, like it's equal parts. It's unknown territory. I think it feels weird at times. And it's also got to be a little intimidating, too, especially because it's like these are my own ideas and this is the first time that we're really sharing them with people, um, you know, that aren't in the band or aren't our family members and they have to like it, you know? Um, so in terms of songwriting, um, you know, you, you guys had, had developed a, a very solid and, you know, global following, you know, for putting out these awesome covers that people related to, um, was it kind of a, um, was writing original music something you guys had always wanted to do and just kind of got to the point that, you know, you had the opportunity to do it or um, what was that process like to, to begin to create original music? Uh, I don't even remember thinking about wanting to write original music. It kind of just happened naturally. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, probably just like trying our hand at it, seeing if we're any good at it, that kind of thing. Like it was mm -hmm. never really like, I don't, know. All, I, don't, I, I don't know what I'm trying to say. From actually. the very I, beginning, I, it was always a goal. Like, we were never going to be a cover band. That was never the plan. Right. Right. But but it, yeah, but what I'm trying to say is it was never like a decision like, okay, from now on, we're going to write original music. It was just like, I wrote a song, guys, do you like it? And it was just like completely random kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then from, it was like, yeah, that's good. We've got a few more here. And then it's like, actually, we've got enough to cover a full album. Let's record it. Yeah. From my, from my understanding, from what I would guess is you guys obviously jammed a lot. You had all your influences that you learned and you'd play. And obviously when you're jamming, and you guys are probably really good at it because that's what you do, you just start jamming stuff in the middle of, you know, you start, you're writing while you're jamming. You know what I mean? You're taking influence. All of a sudden you play some riffs and like, oh, it's a good riff. Like, let me put some drums to it. And then they drum. And all of a sudden you have these like a bunch of different ideas and projects that, you know, from like four years of jamming before you actually wrote that first album. And me, like I said, me and my uh, our producer were talking about it, and like jamming is a, is a skill, and if you're good at it, like it makes I think it makes songwriting a lot easier. So like you said, it probably wasn't like oh we need to start writing. It's just like you have all these things that have just you've learned and you've played some stuff, and you're just like this could be a really nice song. Let's like work on it a little bit more. And um, so I'm I'm sure like I don't know, jamming is like such a beautiful. Uh, collaboration that you know it's i don't know if you've ever tried to jam with somebody that's not really good at it <laughs> and yeah. it's like it's kind of frustrating because the vibe's like, I mean, not, not there the vibe's not there yeah and they're just you know it, it's a skill i mean you have if, if they've never done it before it is really it is difficult because you have to adjust and you you play stuff and if 
And if they're like really by the book and stuff, like they'll stop playing. I'm like, why'd you stop playing? I was like, it wasn't good. I was like, so what? Like, we're just jamming. Like, we'll figure it out. Like, it's going to be, it's going to be broken, but that's why it's awesome. Yeah. It's so much fun because you never really know what's going to happen. It's just like, whatever happens, just go with it. Yeah. It's really, exactly. It's And you try weird stuff and like, sometimes it works. Exactly. I I remember jamming back in high school with, uh, you know, some other guys and I'd be like, wow, I didn't know jamming was so hard. Like when I j- jam with these guys from school, they don't know what, they don't know where we're going in the song, the directions. It just felt forced and so unnatural because yeah. I was so used to jamming with my bros and our chemistry is just so tight. Yep. And so going from that to like the school friends, I was like, wow, this sucks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're like, you, didn't, you guys didn't know I was going to stop right there. Like, I, like yeah. come on. Like, or we're building. Like you guys don't know we're building. Oh my exactly. gosh. Was it just, when you guys got in the studio, uh, I guess, talking more to the drummer, uh, did you feel like you were, have you ever played with a click before, before getting into the studio? Uh, that was, the first album was my first time, and uh, I was actually quite uncomfortable with it. The it's producer, weird, right? The, yeah, if, you're not, the, if you're just used to jamming, it, it is very weird. Yeah, it, it's weird, and I still don't prefer it to this day. <laughs> of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the producer just, like forced me to do it. And I'm like, yes. you, you think, I think, I think I'll play better without it. And it's like, nah, just try it, man. And yeah. to this day, the album's sloppy because of that. <laughs> it's the, the main reason it's sloppy is because some of those slow tempo songs, there's so much yeah. break in between those clicks that there's just like this movement the whole time. It doesn't feel tight at all. Yeah. yeah. And especially with it being new, like it doesn't feel natural. So like you're, you're sitting there and especially something that's got a slower tempo, there's just so much space where you're just waiting for the next time to hit. And it's like, it's yeah. where well, you get in your head pretty quickly. Yeah. We, we learned a lot from that experience of the first album and mm-hmm. especially a lot of things, not what, uh, sorry, what not to do. Totally. Just because there was a lot of mistakes made in that first album, I feel. Yeah, I was gonna say when I when I I, I rec- we recorded like we won a battle of the bands and we got to record like one song and we went in there and we like played it. And I was like that was good and it's like nah, you need to like we listen to it back. It's like we need to do it a, a, a bunch more times to get it like right. And it's, like, yeah. it's really yeah. frustrating because it was like I yeah. thought it was clean. <laughs> <laughs> so are you still in a band now? So I no, sadly like I'm, I've been pursuing uh, athletics the last like four years. So um, when we went to college, you know, I chose. Yeah, to pursue javelin. So I'm a javelin thrower. Oh, I just got a, good, so a bunch of friends. I don't know if you guys know track and field, but I have a bunch of javelin th- uh, friends in Australia um, in the track and field world. And so it's one of those things where I definitely, I've been in music obviously with the page and, and I plan to go back and continue playing, but it was I had to kind of choose between the two of them because they both are very time consuming um, if you want to be the best. And like, you know, that's just, it's just, I had to choose like my body that I know is going to age. I'll be able to come back to, you know, playing music because it's a little bit, it's not as hard on the body. So, for sure. Yeah. So, how yeah. good are you at javelin then? Like, are you elite level or what? He's very uh, good. I'll let him explain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Last year, last year, I, fi- I finished up uh, ranked 52 in the world. And, wow, uh, that's sick. world. Yeah, so and the top thirty six make the Olympics. So I'm trying to make the Olympics this summer. So close. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I finished uh, fifth in the U.S. and I gotta be top three. So, um, yeah, so it's it's been going really well. Last year I was able to compete. A couple of my teammates went and competed in um, Australia, and, and I didn't have the budget. It just wasn't a good time for me to go down there. But I really wanted to because I have, have some friends. So, um, yeah, but it's good. It's it's traveled me to Europe, and I was able to compete over there, and and like. It's great, so I'm really happy I've done it. But man, I always say like if I didn't do that, I'd, I'd be I'd be doing the same thing, trying to cut it as a, a you know drummer in a band and doing some stuff like that. Because the, there's two you know two feelings that I just love in the world. It's competing at a really high level and then performing on stage. And I'm sure you guys feel this is one of the questions that I, I like to talk to bands about. It's like what's it feel like to be on stage and play for so many people that. Um, one, maybe you've never heard you guys before and then become fans or two, like they are diehard fans and like you just get to express yourself on stage. I, I just think it's one of the best feelings in the world. Um, so yeah, what's it like for you guys to perform? Well, we played this one festival that had like about 5,000 in the audience mm. and getting up on stage on that one, because it was also a, a touch of like anticipation we felt from the audience to to see our show because we'd just been on tv this was actually in albania so we'd just been on tv in albania and so everyone had like had just recently uh become familiar with us sure. and then we played this festival 
And um, it was just like a whole bunch of anticipation for us. And it was crazy because as soon as we got up on stage, uh, Kobe gave one wave to the crowd and the crowd went berserk. Like, it was just like, what is this? Yeah. We're, we're not ready for this kind of like reaction. It was our first yeah. time getting that. And yeah, it was, it was insane, mind blowing. It's like, okay, this is what we got to do for the rest of our lives. Yeah. That's awesome. But yeah, there's no, no better feeling than playing live, having a good audience go crazy for your music. There's not, it's like, it's like a drug that you can never get sick of really. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. When, go ahead. Even, yeah, no, sorry. Even when there's like a, you know, a crowd that's not so big, you could be playing to 20 like diehard fans and there's no other place you'd rather be at that very moment. Yeah. There's just such just a like, big energy exchange there that happens no matter who's there because you're connecting on the same thing. And, 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 and from your perspective, being the band, making the music, like you were creating the very thing that is the conduit for that connection almost. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. I mean, it's why you do it. Um, what, what, and so, you know, on that, like I always said, when you're, when you're in high school, like I tell kids like play shows, like you have nothing to worry about. You know, you're, you're, pushing off school you're playing in the band you have no bills you have no nothing and then when you decide to make it like what you guys are doing you guys are taking a chance moving places to make it work i did the same thing like for track like i moved away from family like three times you know just you're trying to go where your best opportunity is and the stakes are a lot higher so you know has that feeling changed like I don't know. There's, there was, it was very free and easy to play when you're younger, obviously. And now it's become, I don't want to say a job, but like, you know, you want it to be your career. So, you know, the stakes have changed. Uh, what is that? How has that been for you guys moving into like more professional and just be like, no, this is like, this is our job. Like we need to perform because yeah, that's yeah. how we want to make our money. Us three, not Todd, the three, uh, us three. Yeah. Um, we all actually quit school to come to Europe. So, at an early age, we knew what we wanted to do and we dedicated our life to it. Yeah. Yeah. But you said like uh, getting into like a more professional, um, you know, state of our career. Like you're asking if it's becoming more stressful for us. Like, is that, is that what you're saying? If we a little bit. Yeah. Do you guys, do you, yeah. Is it, does it feel a little more st stressful? Yeah. And the way yeah. you guys like say put out stuff and I mean, how, just how you need to operate as a band, I guess. It is more of a job now. Like we need to put out weekly videos. So we still got an income on our on our YouTube channel and stuff. Yeah, and like especially for live shows, uh, when we're playing like an important festival or a big gig or something like that, I, I I definitely feel the pressure, especially as the singer. Just like it's it's not as much of an instrument that you can control on, on a day to day basis, the right. vocals. So it's just like you just hope for the best some days, especially if like back to back gigs and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Just yeah, it's a I it's think, a muscle. So I think Todd seems to carry all the stress for the band. He's got, <laughs> he's got some of the tough jobs. He is the, the oldest. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The singer, you know, he, you never really know what to expect. No, nobody notices if Kevin plays the wrong note. He right. doesn't do anything. <laughs> oh no yeah. If Todd, yeah. if Todd makes a mistake, it's like man. Yeah, everybody know. Yeah, no, he's not getting away with that. <laughs> <laughs> all, all eyes on Todd. Yeah. And it's, it's one of those things too, where I think, um, the music industry, in my opinion, is like a totally separate entity from, I think the reason why a lot of people get into music and like to create music, like, you know, when you're making music and in the studio recording songs, like that's creating art. And then I think the music industry has so much t type of like content creation which is just like a se separate thing where it's like you have to feed the machine so has that kind of been a consideration for you guys and is that something that weighs on you and do you feel like that like that need to like stay consistently putting out like instagram posts and social media posts and web entries like do you feel like that's a difficult thing to balance with like the playing and the practicing and the writing definitely because at this point it's basically like it's what we're living off of that that right. youtube money that's uh, the, our main source of income. So it's just like, without that, we'd probably have to go back to Australia and get real jobs. <laughs> but, so without, you know, uploading a few videos every month, it's just, uh, we, we'd, yeah, we wouldn't survive. So mm -hmm. there's definitely that pressure of, you know, okay, guys, look, we've got to learn a song. And especially if we haven't done, like at the moment, we haven't done a, a song for ages, like a, a month or so. Well, yeah, we've been releasing our originals. Yeah. Right. And so it's just like, you but, can, uh, yeah, 
Yeah, that being yeah. said, we still don't compromise the choice of covers that we do. It's not like, man, we need to do one once a week. Let's just throw up any, any old you know, song. We yeah. still like really choose songs that we love that are, and songs that we've been raised on, our old favorites. So yeah, like when we choose a cover that we absolutely love the songs, it's pure pleasure. Yeah, and mm-hmm. that's the thing as well. Like we haven't, we're not like just selling ourselves to the views. It's not like, because if we were doing that, we'd just, I don't know, probably do a Taylor Swift cover or something like that. <laughs> exactly. You know? But yeah. uh, You know yeah, the algorithm, still... exactly. <laughs> exactly right, yeah, that's... the algorithm. But no, we're just doing what we've always done. It's just like, uh, the music that we love, we're like, oh, that's a great song. I love the way that uh, he plays his solo. Let's do a cover of it. That's how it started and that's how it's still going. And it's like a lot of these new uh, covers that we're doing even still, they're only going to get 10,000 views and we know that as we do them. But it's like, I just love this song anyways. So let's give it a try. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Our next cover we're about to upload is Black Betty, the old classic. Okay, awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a funny one. But yeah, like who knows how well it's going to go. We're probably going to make... Fifteen dollars off it. Yeah, we'll get probably. fifty thousand views unless it hits the algorithm. But yeah, you know, nah. we just love to play the songs, and you know, we're not doing that yeah. one for the views. We're doing it for the fun. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. and yeah, and that's what... an element of like you're honing your creativity as well. A lot of times, when you adapt a, a popular song or a song that you guys like, you adapt it to your band and to your skill strengths and everything. So it's like while it's not original music, I think it feeds you know it feeds that element of you that is creative. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it, sorry, Ethan, but it, it just adds, uh, like, I don't know, influ- like influence to our, our memory catalogs. I don't know, I don't know what I'm trying to say here, but yeah, you get my idea that, like, when we're, when we're trying to write new music, we've got, uh, just I don't know, more things to pull from, exactly right. Yeah, thanks, guys. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, I, I mean, it would be, say, unhealthy to like expect everything to pop. And it's almost, it's better to do things because you want to do them. And that's how you keep yourselves like, you keep it even keel and you keep like your catalog like balanced and the stuff that you're uploading. And, you know, if I had to say from your guys' response, like, I don't think that it's changed much since you guys uh, started jamming in the first place. And that's really good. Like you guys are very, you know, I mean, it's, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like a job the way you just responded to all that stuff. And that's really good. That's where, that's how you stay authentic and you keep producing stuff. And that's just, that's just when you get the best, the best results. Like when you're playing live, it's not when you're like forcing things and you, and you have these pressures. So like, I just hope that, you know, as you guys move forward and produce more uh, albums and, and play more shows that that just stays like that, because that's how, those are the bands that we like to listen to. You know what I mean? Like we were, we were talking about before, like you just, I just want the band to, to be like, um, yeah, just like p- c- playing through their instruments. Like I just want, I just want it to be super authentic, and you know, I don't even know authentic's the right word. It's just like, ah, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, just and chill, quote, you know. And to, <laughs> like, yeah, and to quote Seinfeld, we don't like to compromise our ar- artistic integrity. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I lo- bonus points for dropping the Seinfeld quote for sure. Um, something that I want to ask, um, obviously being in the public eye for so many years and, and having many turns with the viral internet machine, uh, that does not come without the lovely internet haters and the snarky commenters. So how do you deal with them? And are there any in particular over the years that have kind of stuck out as just being particularly funny to you or just like memorable in any shape in any way vocalist sucks yeah. <laughs> get a haircut <laughs> oh they, they get a haircut as well yeah the uh classic comment is get a real job <laughs> hippies <laughs> no no the classic comment is um i like the guy with long hair or something like that the, the guy the guy with long hair is good or the guy with cargo shorts is good yeah like that is a classic comment we get that mm. a lot. It's not a hate comment, I guess, but it's just like it's gotten so old, and people keep commenting it like they created this great, and it's still getting so many likes every time someone comments. It. It's like <laughs> it's old. It's like an evergreen joke. Yeah, we have yeah. a lot of those. We have a lot of those on our page too, it's and we don't like, even yeah. create anything. So, like, I can only imagine how it is, and I think it's always interesting because, like, we'll post people's covers of songs as as we have, you know, with with you guys in the past, and um. 
one comment that I, I, we seem to always get anytime we post a cover, um, you know, somebody doing a cover is like, oh, like they ruined that song or like, that's not how it's supposed to sound. But like, that's the whole point of putting a cover out is to put your own spin on it and to pay tribute to artists that inspired you in your own way, using the strengths that you have. And I'm sure you guys have gotten comments like that, but like, I'm very grateful that it hasn't stopped you from continuing to do it because like, that's what it's all about. Yeah, I, I actually think like, um we've been pretty lucky to not have too many hateful comments that like especially in comparison to the positive comments that we get it's just like yeah. the ratio is you know not even considerable yeah no it's actually kind of shocking the the lack of hate comments that are on our channel like people would be like usually i hate cover bands i never watch covers i mm. hate any kind of covers but you guys this could be better than the original or as good as the original yeah really compliments like that that we just don't even deserve. Yeah. And I yeah. know throughout the years, um, you ha your your covers have been shared in particular by, you know, bands and musicians that you've covered. So do you have each any favorite stories of an instance of that happening? Well, Silver Chair. Silver Chair? Yeah. That, we did a cover of Tomorrow a few, uh, like a couple of years ago. Yeah. More or less. And uh, Daniel Johns uh, commented on that video. What did he say? I don't know. Can't remember. <laughs> probably, it's probably so I love you guys. But, yeah, something like that. <laughs> we know him. Getting getting a compliment from Daniel like doesn't beat that. Yeah. So that was definitely a highlight. That's awesome. Tell him about the Offspring. Yeah. Oh yeah, the Offspring. Uh, this was ages ago. Um, and Noodles, the guitarist of the Offspring, he saw our one of our covers, and he's like, "Guys, when we come to Australia, we've definitely got a jam together." So he's like, "That's cool." Time. Yeah. And. Like, firstly, uh, The Offspring is our number one f band of all time. Favorite since we were babies because of our dad, okay. really. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, he he's, like, shared almost all of our Offspring covers. And he's, like, we're basically in regular contact with him. And it's just, yeah, he's a great guy. And on one of our covers, the Coming For You one, he's, like, man, that was so good. Uh, it's lucky you had two fire hydrants near you in case to, put, <laughs> to put the fire out, you know. <laughs> That's awesome. That's it's it's stuff like that that it's like when you guys first like picked up your your instruments back in the day when you could like barely like run around on your own. It's like who would have thought that you would get to that point uh, and be able to interact with the with those people, you know? Yeah, that's actually that was a real shock for us, especially the first couple times where I think the Offspring was one of the first, and then Foo Fighters as well. Yeah. Um, but we've had like a few kind of yeah, yeah. almost close encounters. I'd say what was the most recent one? It was. Uh, we had three doors down. Oh, just three doors down. Share that's our stuff. Yeah. So like the whole, like all the individual band members like shared our stuff individually. It was like, man, these guys really like appreciated that cover. Yeah. And then also Chris... like live Ed Kowalczyk, he mm -hmm. really appreciated we, our cover. We've had heaps of like big bands reach out to us and just say that was awesome, something like that. That's super mm -hmm. cool. Also, one of the coolest ones was uh, Klaus Minor from the Scorpions. He actually posted on on their Facebook account, uh, "Great work on your new album. Uh, good luck with the tour." That was like, Simple. that's, that's awesome. True. That's really that was, cool. Yeah. Because yeah, there's got to be like, yeah, Ethan, go ahead. I'll just say, yeah, Chris and I have had those experiences in doing this, where you're just like, oh, this person follows, and then you have interactions here and there, and uh, you know, same a lot of same people you guys said. And one of the favorite things is like, oh, three doors down, like the whole band shared us. That means that they're talking about us in the band like together in private you know what i mean it's not just yeah. like one person like oh we need like if they all did that it's like now these guys are like they know our names they've had conversations and like that's really cool to think about <laughs> yeah, you know just, to be to be a fly on the wall for those conversations is crazy. <laughs> right like well, yeah exactly it's like ah oh, that's cool yeah that's re that's really some, awesome and sometimes you think ah oh, maybe it's just their social media manager like the three doors down whoever does that but the next thing, like all their individual accounts are, are posting them everywhere. And like, ah, oh, no way. This is the real guys. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's like exactly. they, they, they had to have seen it. It's like, it's like you see somebody liked it or somebody followed it or commented. It's like, oh, that means that like, like Eddie Vedder has definitely like made eye contact with this video at one point in the past. <laughs> so that's what we know? talk about. <laughs> Absolutely. That's what you have to do. And, and it's got to be validating too, because it's like these people that like inspired me to, to record this stuff and to get good at these instruments. Like they're, if they're, if they're digging it, that's awesome. And especially I, I love like the last one that you mentioned where it's like, you know, great job on the album and good luck on the tour. Because at this point, like that's got to be a big focus. It's like everybody that might've enjoyed the covers over the years, like, Hey, like, 
like give a listen to you know the original stuff that we're that we're working on and i know you guys are really excited um for the new album which is coming out in may is that correct um wait what are you now april it's yeah april. so you're yeah may is correct yeah <laughs> I lose all track. I lose all track of time too. So, and it's called it's called What's the Rush now? And we've got two singles out. One you just released, actually. She hates me not a few days ago. Correct? Yeah, yeah. that's right. That's awesome. So, is there a song um, off of this this forthcoming album that you guys are like the most excited to share, or like one that you think is the best off the album? Or these are all like uh, carefully handpicked songs from a, a very large amount of songs that we wrote for this album. Mm-hmm. So they're all like. Uh, equally yeah. important. And yeah, they made the cut. Yeah, exactly. They're all like uniquely awesome too. Like you can't skip a track. These are they're all A sides. <laughs> oh, absolutely, <laughs> they're all single material. You know, put yeah. them all out. Um, I love the comment earlier where it's like you guys first got into the studio way back. You know, pretty much ten years ago, and it's like I didn't realize that we were that heavy. Um, and. I think a lot of times, like I'll, I'll run across your music on Instagram and it's a lot of the acoustic stuff. And then like in preparation for this interview, I spent a lot of time with the two singles. And like, that was a thought that I had is like, these guys are heavy and they rock. Um, right. Is that, that's probably something that like from that first realization in the studio where it's like, wow, like we're kind of heavy. Like it's gotta be an exciting feeling to play loud and to play heavy like that. And it seems like you guys are leaning into that for this new album. Yeah, sure. It's especially like to do with the, um, you know, the production techniques and stuff used in the studio. Like we had a great producer this time who really knew what he was doing up in Sweden. Andy, and, Andy the Rock from King Diamond. Okay, yeah, so he's, cool. he's a heavy metal guitarist himself. And so naturally he'd bring in some of that kind of metalness to the, right. to the sound. And um, yeah, so a lot, a lot of it had to do with him and the way he dialed in the amps and stuff for us. And yeah, and then also just, uh, the songwriting that we, I don't know, the way we wrote the songs and stuff, we were really looking into more kind of uh, hitting the groove a little bit more than mm-hmm. in, pre- in previous albums, I think. We were pretty experimental on our first couple albums, so we kind of tried to knuckle down and go for more of that, more of that mainstream sound. Not mainstream, but just like, uh, what do you call it? Commercial, would you say? A little bit, a little bit more commercial than yeah. our previous stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, slightly more radio friendly because our first couple of albums are some of the tracks in there are pretty hard to listen to, if I had to mm-hmm. be honest. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, always, always your own worst critic, you know, when it comes yeah, to right. stuff like that. Um, yeah, and and yeah, it's definitely like uh, kind of that aspect of being accessible to listeners, where it's like you know you can you can drop the needle on this thing and and you get it, and like you can understand kind of what's going on and and maybe what the message is or, or how it sounds. Um, I really, really like the first two singles and I'm, I'm looking forward, um, to that process. So, uh, of, of the album release. So, um, with the writing process, like you said, you guys have written dozens and dozens of songs for this. Um, were a lot of them kind of coming from jams that you guys were doing or were there elements of like, Hey, like, uh, like Kevin would come in and be like, Hey, like I have this idea for a song. Um, like let's give it a shot. Or was it kind of a mixture of both? Was it was it mostly jams on this one? I was going to say the opposite. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to think now. <laughs> let's, let's say like, it was 50-50 jams and 50-50 like Todd or Blake would have a riff and then would build from that. Mm-hmm. It usually starts with the riff in our band. Yeah. 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 That makes, that makes sense. sense. That's the place to begin. Yeah. I, I think um, the easiest way to start a song is just, you know, with the basic idea of the riff and then... Uh, either a chorus or a verse lyric mel- melody on top of that. Mm-hmm. And if, if, if that hits for the rest of the band members, it's like, okay, let's continue working on this. Yeah. And it's like this idea it's going to work. Yeah. And often, oftentimes it just gets shut down straight away by the other band members. So it's like, <laughs> it never sees a lot of day, but yeah. It's... Is there ever a time, is there ever a time when you guys are playing and um, I found this, like when you first hear a riff, and you put down drums to it, and you have the first thing that comes to your mind, you start playing it, and you're just like, this fits, but I need to find something totally different. You know what I mean? Or you're just like, this works, but like, I think I need I need to mix it up, and like, you have to kind of rewire your brain, because it's the first thing that you hear and want to play, but you're just like, I did this, maybe I did something really similar right. last song, and you're just like, mm. like we need we need something different. Like, how hard is that to kind of like, you know, yeah, no, change? I, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, exactly. Like. We had a few tracks on the al- on this album that were a little too similar 
like that it would been it's been done kind of thing right so we, they didn't make the album purely because you know other tracks sounded too too similar mm. yeah you know what i mean yeah we wanted yeah, to make absolutely. sure that each song on this album uh has its own purpose and does this brings its own kind of thing to the album and so for that reason none of the songs on this album are too similar mm-hmm. but um I was going to say, like, oftentimes the first thing that pops into your mind is usually the best thing. It's just yeah, like, it's what true. you're hearing. It's like, it, it fits. It's good. But then on the other on the other hand, then there was the, what I've been waiting on, yeah. which is the sixth song, uh, the seventh track on the album. And that went through about four or five. Was no, it? It, this, the final version was version seven. Version seven. No <laughs> kidding. That song. So it went through six complete, like, makeovers that just weren't doing it right but mm-hmm. Todd, Todd wanted the riff in it so bad that we just kept getting working on new uh, like structures and arrangements until we found the seventh version which worked and then it finally came together and and it's got to be um like you mentioned earlier it's like a muscle that you develop to like know like when an idea is going to have legs and, and when it's worth exploring and then also I think too in an instance like the seventh track it's like when when you know and like when when just when you know, like, like this is the yeah. one, like we finally nailed it and having the confidence to go with that intuition, um, that's gotta be a skill that is developed over time too, I imagine. Yeah, for sure. Like knowing when something's good enough. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. It's, it's a tough, it's an interesting process. And, um, it's always fascinating to talk about people and, and how they talk to people and how they kind of produce their songs and, um, obviously, we know you guys have a heavy influence on uh, with rock and roll, grunge, and all that stuff. But I wanted to ask, like, what do you guys listen to now? And and, and like, what are some current influences that you guys are you know keen on and, and listen to that um, you know is not the old stuff? Because I'm sure that you know, I mean, we listen to a lot of the old stuff, but that is hardly the ca- like the exclusive catalog that we, Chris and I listen to because we need to go other places because we're. I mean, that's just how we're wired. Are you guys pretty like rock and roll like all the time? Um. Oh, like the, I. I think we're mostly rock and roll all the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, nah, like we we branch out into into all the music of the eighties and nineties. Like we'll go pop and you know heavy metal. But I think after after the early two thousand, we pretty much don't really touch anything. Yeah. No, yeah. So, like, yeah, sure. There's a huge variety of genres from you know pop to metal, but you know, yeah. If you're asking what 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 of those influences make the album, I mean, make the the band, the band's influences, yeah, sure. Like, uh, what's Pearl Jam will of course influence our, our writing, but like Corn, we may Blake may listen to them, but we don't let the, that interfere with the band's influences. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Despite maybe what Blake would want, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> there needs That's more. Fun. There needs to be more corn on the radio. That's what I was thinking. Corn Absolutely. and Slipknot. Wait, there's not enough out there. Let's get him back. Blake, into Blake the would mix agree here. with you. They didn't make. They, they didn't make enough radio friendly stuff. I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just Blake smiles and nods. <laughs> so he doesn't have a microphone, Blake. No, no. 100% corn should be up there, man. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that's the one takeaway that we're going to get from this interview is the uh, <laughs> corn adv- advocacy continues. Uh, Any corn like, covers? Have you guys ever ever covered? Oh. <laughs> now nah, these guys don't want Not it. Not yet. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, you know, this is, it's a democratic system. You know, you get yeah. three votes against and only one vote for. <laughs> hey, exactly. keep at it, Blake. They'll, they'll, they'll give in at some time and it's going to be, it's going to pop because it's different. Yeah, I, I, lo- I love my new metal. Yeah. Absolutely. Good stuff. What but a we weird tr- time of music that was. Yeah, yeah, that was like a, I don't know, that was a weird episode, huh? Yeah. yeah. It's like r- some right be- awesome stuff came out of it. Yeah, honest. absolutely. And, and and it's funny that like now, like all of the, the, the music from like the late 90s that everybody kind of used to make fun of is like starting to get cool again. Like I know, like I think the standard bearers of that would be like Creed and Limp Bizkit. It's like everybody used to shit on them for years and now it's like, oh, hell yeah, like Creed's playing again and they're awesome. <laughs> And now they're headlining festivals and selling out tours, and it's, it's like unbelievable. What to the hate, yeah, yeah, it's actually crazy. And that's the crazy thing. Yeah, go ahead. So I, I, think hear what you have the, to say. I think it's the nostalgia, really. People yeah. look back and like maybe they weren't so bad. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, and it's just kind of one of those things where it's like when you put something out into the world that you make, it's like it's really not up to you 
at all, like what people think of it or how it's received. And a band like that, I mean, they were char topping the charts 25 years ago and then they became, you know, a punchline. And then now all of a sudden, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're getting a lot of acclaim again. And it's just kind of that element that like, when you put something out in the world, it's like, you kind of have to let go and just whatever happens to it happens. And, you know, as long as you have the confidence in what you created and you enjoyed that process, like, you know, that's kind of got to be where you find your satisfaction. Yeah. And I think like 90% of, you know, a band's successfulness is just completely out of their own hands. Yeah. It's, it's outside factors, nothing to do with the music, nothing to do with the band's skill. It's mm -hmm. just, it's so a lot of right. luck that goes into it. It's like, did the right person hear this at the right time with the right access to introduce it to a lot of other people, you know? Exactly. It's yeah. crazy because we feel that- Were they in a good of, mood when they heard it? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. exactly. Yeah, it's just- 100%. You, like the best album in the whole world could be written and nobody would ever hear no it. No one would know, exactly. Yeah. And as a musician and as a band, like- you probably you reach that point multiple times where it's like all right like this is going to be this is going to be the one and like this one's going to go or you have you have one of those brushes with with like maybe somebody that has influence and they dig what you do it's like okay like this is the start of something and like oftentimes it never is and the thing that actually propels you forward is something that you never thought could or you wouldn't have even expected um and it's just kind of i think if you're an artist you just that ability to go with the flow and realize that you, the more you can't, you can't control it is becomes more and more valuable. Yeah. yeah. And like, like you said, going with the flow is like one of the most important things because you never really know what it will be. Like, so you just got to take everything, everything mm -hmm. that comes your way. Yeah. It's, a, I mean, it goes from how people receive your music to like, Hey, is this festival running on time? And are we going to be on at the time that we were supposed to, or like, you know, is, is, is this amp not working great right now or shit? Like I broke a string, you know, just different things like that. And being able to, you know, maintain your cool in, in those scenarios. Yeah. And one of the examples that I really love is that, uh, just about taking every opportunity is that we played one of our worst gigs in Innsbruck where, in Austria where nobody came and it was like just a very dead gig kind of mm -hmm. wouldn't be too, too sad if we forgot it. And then, uh, one thing led to another. And one of the people at that show, uh, ended up getting us a few other gigs in, in the area. And it just kind of grew on from that until it was like, yeah, we were playing some really big shows in Austria with the, mm -hmm. yeah, with the mayor of, uh, Kitzbühel. Kitzbühel. Yeah. No Which kidding. Like one, yeah. It's like one of the richest cities in Europe. And we're playing for the mayor and we're just like, wow. how did this happen? <laughs> Once again, you never know. Like you never know what this thing is going to give you next. <laughs> exactly right. Just That's crazy. take all the opportunities you've got. Absolutely. And I know, um, I think uh, as I saw on your website, you've got uh, maybe 14 or 15 shows planned right now all throughout Europe um, this summer and into the fall. Is there any one in particular that you're really, really excited for? Yeah, definitely. Uh, Top Fest in Slovakia. Just, mm -hmm. just because the Scorpions are headlining that one, so it's yeah. like this is probably the biggest thing we've done to date. Because uh, yeah, some cool bands on this bill: Scorpions, yeah. Five Finger Death Punch, POD. Yeah. Okay, oh that that is cool. Just to see like mix up everything like on the bill next exactly. to some of those names. Yeah, it's that's a trip. That's it's really our first really time torn. being on a, on a like big festival, so it's we're pretty excited about this one. Yeah, that's yeah. great. And it's a perfect time too, because at that point, like this, this entire summer and fall, like you'll have the new album to tour off of. And, um, what a cool experience that is to, you know, for the first time, introduce some of these songs to a live audience. And I know you'll have your diehards there that are, that are going to that show to hear their favorite song from the new album live for the yeah. first time. And just that anticipation, like those are the feelings they just keep you coming back. Yeah, no, we're, we're super excited to be playing these new songs live. Can't wait to hear, see how the crowds respond. And yeah, we've played a few of them before, just like g giving, you know, sneak previews of what the album's got to come. Mm -hmm. And uh, the response has been crazy, especially for She Hates Me Not. Everyone goes crazy for that one. It's a like, headbanger. A, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of that one. I've been, I've been jamming that one the last yeah, few sweet. days for sure. So um, <laughs> I've only heard two so far, but, you know, it's in, it's in the running for my favorite from the album. <laughs> yeah. So a couple of weeks' time, I'll have the full array and, uh, 
I'll, I'll be really excited to uh, to listen to it. Um, so as we close again, uh, for everyone listening, uh, just once again, uh, we've got the new album coming out. Uh, What's the Rush Now? Uh, coming out in just a few weeks. Uh, there's two singles out right now that you totally need to go ahead and listen, stream, uh, support these artists, buy some merch, um, and and buy the buy the physical records, man. Like buy some CDs, buy some merch. Uh, I know that goes a lot further of a way than just streaming on Spotify or Apple Music. Yeah, for sure. And we're doing vinyls now too, so we're okay, embracing okay. Awesome. the old school. Oh yeah, yeah. The, yeah. the rock and roll yeah. ethos. I like that. Exactly. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say that if there is a band that you could open for, you said you're opening for Scorpions. If there's a band other than Corn that you guys could open for, <laughs> who would it be? Other than Corn? Metallica? Metallica. Yeah, Metallica would be Yeah, sweet. Metallica? Okay, Metallica. nice. Yeah. Heck yeah. yeah. The Offspring. Yeah, Absolutely. The offspring. Yeah. No, but obviously so Corn first. <laughs> yeah. Corn first. I don't even like Corn that much, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he's, you're sitting there right now. I was oh, like, no, I don't know no, how this you can't thing go back on it. You <laughs> can't go back on it. Now. Hey, once again, this is a case study that you know a, a lot of things are out of your control. <laughs> exactly. You never know. Dude. We might, we might, there might be some contacts made from the corn party after this. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because I'm sure, I'm sure they're listening to the Grunge Bible podcast, Ethan. You know what? It's actually funny. I've got a really stupid story oh, yeah. about how we were playing in Melbourne, and Brian Welsh rocks up with a pram. And his huge dreadlocks, and he's uh, there in like watching our sh- watching our set. And at the end of the set, he comes up to us and goes, "Oh, you guys are really good. You know the band Corn?" And I said, "Oh yeah, I know them." But I was like sixteen, right? And I was like, "Yeah, I know them." And he's like, "Yeah, I'm the guitarist. I'm Brian Welsh." And I'm like, "Oh, that's <laughs> sick." And then that was it. Like I didn't I didn't say anything else. And I'm like, like "Yeah, right, have say. a good day, man." Yeah. yeah, I didn't know what to say. And I, like I didn't know Corn that well at that time. So I was just like, "Yeah." yeah. And even if you did know the music that well, like I you mean, went back and just... typed it in C O R N, like Corn. <laughs> yeah, you just see like a bunch like, of like, agriculture it? fields. <laughs> like I don't see you in there. Oh man, that's yeah. that's hilarious. I'm always that's like one of my biggest fears. Like any time. Like if there's like a public figure around it, it, it would probably be with music, like going to a show or something. And it's like, oh yeah, like, you know, such and such, like I'm in that. I'm like, oh shit, I feel like an idiot because I didn't know it. Uh, yeah. But also like, uh, just like a very, like, if I were to, there's a few people musically that like, if I met them, like, I just like, wouldn't know what to say, um, you know. Just freeze up. Yeah. Like it's, it's inevitable. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's part of the part of the part of the, the landscape for it. So um, Todd Blake and Kevin, thank you guys so much for coming on. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. Uh, can't wait for the new record to come out. And uh, I know that when that comes out, we'll want to share it a little bit on our page. If you guys are good with that. Yeah, yeah that'd sick. be awesome. Thanks heaps guys. It's been right an absolute on. pleasure talking with your legends. No, thanks for having us. Yeah, of course. Thank you guys. So that's mixed up everything. So new album coming out soon. And uh, I'm sure this is uh, the next step on a long line of awesome stuff that we're going to hear from you guys. So really looking forward to the future. Yeah, cheers, yeah it's going to be great. Yeah, we'll lots, catch of, up. lots of fun stuff happening in the future. Hell yeah. Yeah, we'll catch up towards the end of the year and have you back on or something like that. So cheers. It'd be a Sounds pleasure. Sweet. Keep up the good work, fellas. Love the Grunge Bible. <laughs> Never miss those AIC Mondays. Absolutely. <laughs> Although, like, depending on the time zone, like, it's not as bad as if you guys were on Australia, but, like, I know, like, I post them at, like, like six in the morning East Coast US time, and it hits like at like a vastly different time of the day. For, yeah, for our, we get for them our, in the afternoon. Yeah, exactly. It's like, oh yeah, it's, it is you know, Monday just, today. It keeps you going. Yeah, exactly. Oh, by the way, so <laughs> I might have to, I'll, maybe I'll hit a special edition so it hits for the morning for Europe one of these days. Wow. <laughs> That'll be special. That'll be a treat for sure. Exactly. Rolling out the red carpet. Uh, thanks again, guys. <laughs> Appreciate you guys. Um, you're awesome. And uh, thanks for coming on. No, thanks, guys. It's Appreciate been a pleasure. It. Right on. And there you have it. The boys from Mixed Up Everything. Incredible. It's been a long time coming. Um, feels good. You know, there's some interviews that I uh, just feel right and just feel like something that we should have maybe did a long time ago, but uh, these guys have been, um, yeah, a part of the music scene, a part of our music scene uh, in the last five years, and um, it's been great. So I'm glad that we've uh, yeah, had them on, and um, you know we'll see a lot more of them in the future, I think. 
Yeah, I would totally agree with that. Um, so I hope you enjoyed our conversation with the boys from Mixed Up Everything. Uh, thanks for listening to the show and supporting it. I would also like to extend a thank you to our producer, Drew McFadden. Uh, and as we close, uh, I think, um, could I make the executive decision that the two songs of the week should be the two singles from the forthcoming album? Yeah, that's fine with me. Awesome. So we're going to book it with that. Uh, we've got Would You Be Me and She Hates Me Not uh, from Mixed Up Everything uh, as our songs of the week for this episode 162 of the Grunge Bible podcast. So I think that'll just about do it for us, Ethan. We're going to get on out of here. It's a Saturday afternoon. It's beautiful here, and I can't wait to get outside and get out of this chair. That's right. We got things to do. We got drinks to drink and exactly. we have friends to see. So. A lot of tendrils. That's right. So thank you, everybody, for making it to the end of the podcast. You're a trooper. We'll see you, hopefully, same time, same place next week. Rock and roll, guys. Rock and roll. Stay heavy, everybody. Yeah. Stay heavy, everybody. Click, clack, click, clack. The <laughs> Clickety-clack. <laughs> Goodbye, America. Delaware. <laughs> Take care, America. <laughs> <laughs>